sexual orientation in Harry Potter. We also have Edward A. Zeman from Winthrop University. Uh, he's a senior English major, and his paper is titled Feminine Trumps Masculine, The Gendered Power Struggle Revealed Through Mythology. Uh, we also have a co-presented paper with um, Sarah Wallace, who is a uh, graduate from UNC Charlotte with a degree in English, and Valerie Bright, a second year grad student in English with a concentration in children's literature, uh, also from UNC Charlotte, and their paper is titled Gender Roles Confunded, Harry Potter and the Distribution of Gendered and the Disruption of Gendered Children's Novels. Just judging from the titles, I think we're all going to have different interpretations of gender, which I really like when that happens. Um, because the popularity of Harry Potter as books coincided with the growth of popularity and accessibility of online discussion forums, fans and scholars of Harry Potter have had an unprecedented opportunity to enter into immediate conversations with each other. One of the most wide-ranging and significant of these conversations is about gender. It's been a contested category in Harry Potter criticism and in the fandom almost since the start of public discourse about the books. As early as 2000, Christine Schaefer wrote in the online magazine Salon, quote, Harry's fictional realm of magic and wizardry perfectly mirrors the conventional assumption that men do and should run the world. Girls, when they are not downright silly or unlikable, are helpers, enablers, and instruments. The online responses to this article encapsulated the gender debate in miniature. Some people passionately agreed with Schaefer, while others equally passionately defended the portrayal of females in the series. And scholarly analysis offers a similar range of arguments, with some critics seeing the books as significantly sexist, and others seeing them as actually challenging traditional gender paradigms. If gender is a hotly contested category in Harry Potter, sexual orientation is probably even more so. This topic became a major one in public discourse online about Harry Potter in 2007, when a fan asked J.K. Rowling, whether Headmaster Dumbledore had ever been in love. Rowling answered, I truthful answer to you, I always thought of Dumbledore as gay. Within hours, and I'm not kidding, hours, the <laughs> internet had exploded with an astounding number of responses and all sorts of things. I participated in several of them, including one uh, on the list sort of child lit from uh, Rutgers, and I was interested in the range of the conversations. Some people argued that Dumbledore, notwithstanding, the Harry Potter books are dangerously heteronormative. Others criticize Rowling either for A, including a gay character at all, or B, for not including that gay character overtly. And still others argue that the books do present non-traditional sexualities and gender play through a variety of characters like Remus Lupin, Tonks, and Madame Booch. But at least one critical analysis argues that the main genre of Harry Potter, the school story, actually invites us to read the narrative in oppositional ways when it comes to gender and sexuality. And I quote Tyson Pugh and David Wallace, who say, the tension between the uniformity of gender and its at times disruptive presence within the school story genre bears the potential either to undermine or reinforce restrictive gender roles. So Pugh and Wallace see the structure of the story as actually encouraging contradictory readings. But my purpose today is not to take a position on whether Harry Potter books provide progressive or regressive depictions of gender roles, or whether Albus Dumbledore or any character can in fact be read as representing non what I want to do is to look at a few of the different methods by which audiences resist and reinscribe canonical presentations of gender and sexuality in Harry Potter, and the ways that they reclaim and rewrite aspects of the canon to which they have aesthetic or political objections. Now, I had intended today to talk about scholarly and popular audiences. I wanted to look at some of the academic conversations at the way that critics construct the whole question of gender so that they can do it in a way that allows them to remain fans at the same time that they can have objections. Uh, but then I read this paper aloud and sorry the scholarly part got the axe. Um, too long. So now I'm going to turn to my analysis of one form of popular audience response, specifically fan fiction. And I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with fan fiction, but just in case you're not, here's a quick definition. Fan fictions are amateur stories written by fans based on characters and worlds originally created by other authors. Fan fiction is not plagiarism or theft. It's an example of what media scholar Henry Jenkins calls participatory culture. It's a transformative act on the part of fans, a conversation, if you will, between audience and author, and between audiences and audiences. Fan communities themselves are exercises in collaborative creativity. 
Though Harry Potter fans are a hugely diverse bunch, we can safely say of all the fan fiction writers that however much they adore the series, they are not content to accept the wizarding world exactly as Rowling has created it. Some writers subvert that world, others reinforce and extend it, some do both things in the same story. So gender and sexuality are contested topics in fan fiction as well as in academic and journalistic analysis, and today I'd like to look at fan fiction as an example of textual query. When J.K. Rowling outed Albus Dumbledore, she sent legions of fans scurrying back to the books looking for clues, trying to find the gay Dumbledore that they might have missed at first reading. And in searching the subtext for evidence of alternative sexualities, readers were doing something that I believe to be unprecedented in the study of literature. They were taking the practice of query, which is often hidden in covert, and they were not only making it over, but they were demanding that it be made over. They were asking for and performing a widespread, full-scale query of a significant cultural context. Although there are any number of legitimate ways to query a text, they all share the goal of exploring the constructed nature of sexual and gender identity categories, such as male, female, gay, and straight. Querying forces us to question the binaries of our culture, our normed and unnormed categories. As the Wikipedia even, I mean, it's gotten to the point, it's as basic as Wikipedia, um, queer theory suggests, quote, it can be argued that queer theory's main project is not the interrogation of homosexuality, but the subverting and challenging of heterosexuality as unmarked and natural. Now, culturally, we tend to set up normative categories that function as a kind of theological default. Whatever thing is the norm is unmarked in the sense that it seems natural to us, so obvious that we don't need to mention it and we often don't even see it. So for instance, when some people insist that Rowling didn't need to mention Dumbledore's sexuality in the books because the story is not about sexual orientation, they aren't seeing the heterosexual default. They aren't seeing the heterosexual orientation of the books. For instance, take Severus Snape. His entire character rests on the fact that his whole life is defined by his love for a woman. The story could not unfold the way it does without Snape's heterosexuality, but because that's the cultural norm, it is not to be seen. And this heterosexual default is everywhere in Harry Potter. But it's a norm that seems so unmarked that we don't even recognize the books as a powerful statement about the nature and dominance of heterosexuality. The process of queering challenges this inability to see the norm. It takes off the invisibility cloak, as it were. To queer a text is to see that all our gender categories are in fact marked. And in fan fiction, we see some of the most obvious examples of the queering of Harry Potter. From the standpoint of audience studies, fan fiction is an invaluable indication of reader response because it's the sort of individualized record that ordinary readers in the past rarely left us. Particularly in Slash, that is homoerotic or homoromantic pairings that readers create based on ostensibly heterosexual characters we get a sense of which characters actually read queer to the so-called ordinary reader, not to authors and literary critics, uh, and what the queer codes are. Um, Harry Potter fans read queer subtext in a wide variety of characters and romantic pairings. Among the most popular are Remus Lupin series Black stories, Harry Draco stories, Harry Snape stories. Female pairings are rarer for reasons I can't get into today, but we do see them in uh, Hermione Ginny, Hermione Pansy, and there's a kind of flourishing Professor McGonagall, Madame Hooch subcategory. <laughs> the scattered nature of online Harry Potter fanfic makes definitive statistics difficult to come by. But even if we look only at the largest archive of Potter fanfic, housed at fanfiction.net, or I'll call it FFN for short, uh, we find some interesting numbers. Potterfic constitutes by far the largest category on FFN. As of this past Thursday, there were approximately 551,000 Harry Potter stories archived at FFN. And keep in mind that a lot of writers don't archive their things at FFN because it has no editorial standard. For comparison, the next largest category is Twilight with 189,000 stories. If you go to FFN, you'll find nearly 3,000 Harry Draco stories and almost 12,000 Remus series ones. Although there are only about 250 Dumbledore Grindelwald stories at FFN, <laughs> Slash fans were quick to pick up on the same sex implications of that pairing in Deathly Hallows. The first live journal group devoted to Dumbledore Grindelwald appeared only 24 hours after Deathly Hallows was published, June 21st, 2007. <laughs> it was published June 22nd, 2007. Up comes the LJ community on Dumbledore Grindelwald. Uh, so this was three months before Rowling uh, revealed Dumbledore's sexual orientation. 
So fans obviously don't need Rowling's impetus to have been queer in Harry Potter almost since the beginning. The first Harry Draco stories, for instance, appeared around 2000. So fans use fan fiction both to challenge and expand canonical representations of queerness and straightness um, and to rewrite them. So in the interest of time, I'm going to limit myself to two parallel examples related to Albus Dumbledore. Fans use Rowling's declaration of Albus's sexuality for their own purposes, incorporating it into their personal canon in whatever ways will allow them to keep intact their chosen versions of the characters. Interesting, the world has been established, fans already have their head canon, and they're just going to ignore whatever Rowling says that it doesn't fit. Uh, for instance, there's a fairly small but dedicated band of writers committed to the idea that there is a romantic relationship between Headmaster Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall. Fans call this pairing MAD, that's M-M-A-D for the initials of Nerva McGonagall, Alice Dumbledore. And the stories tend to be very traditionally domestic, like 50s sitcom sort of. There's lots of depictions of conventional courtship, wedding children, grandchildren, housekeeping, all that sort of thing. Now you might think that the revelation of gay Dumbledore would have sort of put pay to the whole Minerva Albus relationship idea, but it would be wrong because mad fans simply either ignore the whole gay Dumbledore flap or they subvert Rowling's canonical statement in ways that will allow them to support their chosen reading. They often use Dumbledore's rumored heterosexuality to support their interpretation, or his rumored homosexuality to support their interpretation of his heterosexuality. I'll give you an example from a fun metafiction story called A Favor. The author, whose name is Remus Rocks My Socks, uh, <laughs> imagines Dumbledore as a real person and J.K. Rowling as his biographer. And in the story, Dumbledore is married to Professor McGonagall and he comes to Rowling to ask her a favor. Can't she please spread a story to muggle readers that will allow him and Minerva to live in peace instead of having invasive stories written about them by fans? And the fictional Rowling in the story says, you have to realize, Albus, that people will always continue to speculate or just find a way around what I've told them. I mean, look at history. I told the public that no relationship would ever occur between you and Minerva, and they figured I had no idea what I was talking about, even though they also believed that I just invented you. Then I tried killing you all. <laughs> but not even death could stop mad fans. I don't think anything can sway them from believing you and Minerva have a relationship. And then Alba says, no, no, listen. This time I have a foolproof plan. If you do this, I guarantee you people will leave Minerva alone. If you would just, and then he leans over and whispers to me. And Rowling says, okay, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and then the next line of the story is Rowling saying, my truthful answer to you is, I always thought of Dumbledore as gay. <laughs> but for other fans, Albus's homosexuality is as good as canonical. In another fun metafiction story called I Dream of Plagiarism by Cat Farrell, Professors McGonagall and Snape and the school nurse Madame Pomfrey are bemoaning the humiliations to which they are subjected by fan writers. <laughs> McGonagall says, and the number of, number of people who are determined to put me into a long-term relationship with Albus of all people. Is it so hard for these silly muggles to figure it out? There's a reason he has a penis for a pet. What part of flaming do they not understand? <laughs> ostensibly powerfully driven heteronormative of narratives the way Harry Potter is. I haven't really begun to explore the myriad ways that fans reinterpret the world of Harry Potter to suit their needs, cultural and psychological. And the responses are so varied that generalizations are difficult to assert. But I will offer this one, that even when fans find themselves in conflict with ideological and aesthetic representations in canon, whether those are representations of gender or sexual orientation, they simply create for themselves a new Harry Potter universe, one that allows them to remain active fans even as they critique the original presentation. Okay. I apologize in advance. I'm going to speak really loudly in case the Spirit Squad kicks in again. <laughs> <laughs> Let me begin by saying that uh, criticism, as it relates to J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter novels, typically takes on uh, three connotations. The first being, are they even worth reading? 
The second being, are they appropriate and for what age groups? And the third being the reason that we're here, uh, academic discourse. And uh, we look at the Harry Potter novels for a variety of reasons, and my reason today is to show that J.K. Rowling has grounded her story and characters in a rich history of gender conflicts and archetypes, and that a reading in which the destabilization of gender binaries and the fulfillment of these archetypes is recognized will open the reader to new, new interpretations of the novel's events. To support my arguments, three points will be asserted. First, that Rowling's use of strong female characters subverts the traditional petrilineal system in favor of the matrilineal system. Next, that the flipping of these systems switches the dominance of gendered binaries. Masculine violence and aggression loses out to feminine nonviolence, which I'll refer to as passivity. Finally, all of these ends are realized through feminine archetypes drawn from biblical texts, Grecian epics, and the divine comedy. The initial area of focus for this reading is the subversion of the patrilineal system, which has two main components in itself. The first is families headed by women. The Weasleys are a perfect example in my estimation. The family as a whole is of a lower class, as depicted by Lucius Malfoy's and others' insults of the family. These insults begin early in the first book with Draco's comments to Harry and Ron in Madame Malkin's rope shop. It's introduced again in the second book with Lucius Malfoy's comments to the Weasleys in Flourish and Blots, and they increase in severity and number as the novels progress. However, it is Arthur Weasley who brings much of the strain onto his family, and Mrs. Weasley who relieves it. Arthur is the muggle-obsessed Ministry of Magic grunt. His oddities account for much of the family's social status problems, whereas Molly Weasley, the caregiver and mother figure to all, strengthens the family and imbues the Weasleys with the strength to accept and rise above their lower class standing. Between home cooking, awful knitted sweaters, great big hugs, and a very concerned parenting style, even for children not her own, Molly turns the burrow into a sort of haven for her characters. Other examples of feminine heads of households differ from the Weasleys, but I argue are essentially the same at their core. The Malfoys, for example, are clearly headed by Lucius. However, Narcissa is the one is not the one who is sent to Azkaban, nor is she the one whose wand is taken by Voldemort and subsequently destroyed. Further, it is her actions and not her husband's which ensure the safety of their son Draco. Similarly, Luna, despite coming from a single parent home in which her father is the head, appears to have more power and influence than Xenophilix. Luna is a calming force for Harry and other characters time and again. And it is Xenophilius who is driven mad after Luna's capture, not the girl herself. Finally, Neville comes from a matriarchal home, led by his grandmother, which may account for some of his less than impressive heroics in the early books. However, Neville's compa compassionate and concerned nature benefits the heroes early on, while his exposure to danger enables him to de develop a more aggressive uh, type of masculinity that serves him better in the later novels. In fact, of the primary heroes of the novel, none appear to have grown up in an obviously patriarchal household. However, the subversion of the patrilineal system really turns with the second point, which is inherited power. Do characters inherit from their mother or their father? The primary examples of this are Harry Potter, Severus Snape, and Lord Voldemort. First, Voldemort, whose father was a muggle, inherited his wizarding power from his mother which is important because it is Voldemort's mother and not his father whose blood can be traced back to Salazar Slytherin. Thus Voldemort inherits from his mother his wizarding powers, which eventually become his obsession, and a rich legacy of magic and magical abuse from his mother's father, which he eventually uses to kill his own father, spurning his blood. Similarly, Severus Snape is a half-blood who owes his wizarding powers to his mother. Snape even goes so far as to adopt part of his mother's maiden name entitling himself the half-blood prince, trying tying himself even more closely to his mother than his father. <coughs> it is fitting that Snape, like Voldemort, like Harry, should identify more closely with his mother than his father, yet these characteristics, these characters, are inextricably tied to their fathers in their appearance and temperaments. Young Voldemort manipulates his good looks, and young Harry is arrogant and cocksure. However, in, adapting, in adopting the moniker of half-blood prince, Snape makes a statement that his pride lies in his mother's lineage. Finally, and with a touch of irony, both of Harry's parents, while wizards, are not equal in blood status. Rather, Lily Potter is a mudblood, 
a magical muggle for all intents and purposes, making Harry a half-blood, like Voldemort and Snape before him. Harry identifies more closely with his mother than his father in coming to a true understanding of his mother's sacrifice for him. Through this understanding, Harry seems to shed his emotional and angst-filled exterior and adopt a far more out mature outlook on his parents, himself, and Voldemort. Additionally, while Harry more closely resembles his father than his mother, his eyes are constantly referred to as Lily's eyes, the significance of which will be addressed shortly. Magical inheritance and personal identity formation through mothers leads to the third major point of my paper, which is that masculine aggressiveness and violence, which is usually privileged over feminine powers, is flipped to favor feminine nonviolence and passivity. In fact, according to the sex roles inventory of Dr. Sandra Benham, a prominent psychology research in the field of gender studies and androgyny, aggressiveness is a stereotypically masculine trait, while passivity is feminine. Thus, it is not merely cultural perceptions of these traits, but a measurable frequency of their emergence that validates them as masculine or feminine. The two prime examples of this flipping come in the form of Harry and Snape, both of whom owe their uniquely passive powers to the same woman, Lily Potter. Harry's ultimate power is realized as he replicates the act of his mother, sacrificing himself to protect his friends. Similarly, Snape's greatest contribution comes in the form of his numerous sacrifices for the cause, including killing Dumbledore and ultimately sacrificing himself. Indeed, Harry makes his sacrificial decision in the chapters adjacent to those in which we learn about Snape's sacrifices and the reasoning, reasoning for his actions. Both Harry and Snape undertake a journey by which their true powers are revealed, Harry's to himself and Snape's to us. We know that Dumbledore is perhaps the most powerful wizard who ever lived, and Voldemort is certainly also in contention. We also know that characters like Bellatrix the Strange, Sirius Black, Mad-Eye Moody, and Lucius Malfoy can attribute many of their accomplishments to brute force and violent manipulation of magic. However, all of this power comes from wands and traditional forms of magic. Snape's true power comes from an understanding that he must carefully execute a long con against Voldemort, rather than try to take him on alone. And Harry also realizes that he must be the same in adopting the non-aggressive tactics that Lily Potter used to defeat Voldemort 16 years earlier. Harry, Snape, and the others are able to defeat him once and for all. This feminine power contrasts with the phallocentric power riddled throughout the novel. Chief among these sources of power are brooms, wands, and unique objects such as Nagini and the Sword of Gryffindor. While there is certainly a body of success surrounding the use of these items, the slaying of the basilisk with the sword being one, there are many examples where the use of these items fail. There are times when brooms aren't fast enough, when wands are not powerful enough, or when their allegiances simply do not align with their possessors. And this is a lesson that Voldemort never catches on to. He does not understand the passive feminine power as Harry and Snape do. He is unable to grasp power that is not brute force or manifested through logical, magical means. Having established what ultimately results from the interplay of Rowling's characters and their gendered heritage and power, it is critical that one looks at the means by which she arrives at this end. There are certain archetypes that Rowling injects into the story, feminine archetypes taken from biblical, Grecian, and other texts that frame this matrilineal inheritance of power as transcendent and very nearly divine. Lily Potter best exemplifies this description. In an overly simplistic formula, Lily is to Harry what Beatrice was to Dante a transcendent, guiding, driving force which ultimately imbues Harry with the will to complete his perilous journey. Unlike Beatrice, Lily does not appear to Harry often in traditional visions. However, certain other images and memories of her make their way to him frequently. The Mirror of Erised is one example, as is the chapter in Book 4, where a figure of Harry's mother emerges from his wand during his conflict with Voldemort. Harry also hears stories of his mother from a number of characters, sneezes sees Snape's memories of her in the Pensee, and is told time and again that he has his mother's eyes, a constant reminder of the power that she gave him. An argument could be made that Harry's father is also present at many of the moments his mother is, in the Pensee with Snape's memories of the final battle. Many might also claim that his father is also inspiring, and that he models himself after his father more than his mother, and I don't necessarily disagree. However, Harry becomes conflicted over the character of his father, something that is never called into question with his mother. The father figure, figure is also supplanted at times by Dumbledore, Sirius Black, and Remus Lupin. Most importantly, 
The final battle is won through a series of events reflective of his mother's struggle against Voldemort and her non-aggressive tactics. Harry sacrifices himself and then defeats Voldemort, not with a hex or a charm, but a defensive spell. Thus, while Harry may potentially be less cognizant of ties to his mother than to his father, and less mindful of molding himself after his mother, I believe that his mother's influence is significantly greater at the novel's conclusion. It may seem rather obvious after the fact, but Harry having his mother's eyes is no accident. It is yet another tie between him and his mother. Not only did he acquire some wizarding powers from her, as well as the ability to defeat Voldemort through the sacrifice that only one other person made in the novel, but he also inherited her eyes. Calling them the windows of the soul, or the mirror of the soul, or anything else, they are nothing if not a physical reflection of the metaphysical inherited features of Harry's mother. There are other women, in addition to Lily Potter, in whom feminine archetypes forge great characters. Narcissa Malfoy, for the small role she plays, seems strikingly similar to the goddess Thetis. As the goddess asked for supplication at the knees of Zeus, so did Narcissa ask for the help of Severus in protecting her son from Voldemort, saying, if you are there to protect him, Severus, will you swear it? Will you make the unbreakable vow? In fact, the resemblance between Thetis and Narcissa's request become more striking when taken in the context of how they ask for help at the knees. And it becomes more apparent as the novel progresses that, as the novels progress, that Narcissa, evil as she might be in the day to day, cares deeply only for her son, Draco. This trait of her runs unmistakably to the progression of matrilineal dominance in the novel and bears a striking resemblance to her character foil, Molly Weasley. While the notion of Molly Weasley and Narcissa Malfoy being similar seems silly on a surface level, their concerns are essentially the same. Though their circumstances are different, Molly Weasley lends herself nicely to a comparison with the Iliad's Penelope, an icon of marital fidelity, womanly strength, and maternal grace. She cares for her children with great outward affection and protects them with a great ferocity, while also remaining loyal to her husband Arthur, through whom many of the hardships the Weasley family experiences are brought. Once again, Mr. Weasley is clearly the breadwinner, and Odysseus, when he returns, clearly the head of household. However, Penelope holds down the fort when Odysseus is away, and Molly is the primary protective force for her children. One need only look to the change in Mrs. Weasley in Book 7 to see that in addition to her dedication to parenting and maintaining the Weasley family, <coughs> she is also a woman of great strength. The final archetypal comparison cycles back to Lily Potter, the most pivotal female character in the novel, besides Hermione. Lily's stature as a transcendent mother constructs in her the unmistakable image of a Madonna figure. The Virgin Mary, with whom the lily flower is often associated, cares for her son from conception to death and beyond. Mary's role as a mother did not cease in the death of her son, and according to many Christian believers, did not cease with her death either. The same is true of Lily. One might even argue that of all of Harry's companions, none helped him in the way his mother does. She, with her seemingly infallible good character, inspires him to accept what must be done, helps to guide him through the final task of killing Voldemort, and is remembered, we can assume, for the remainder of Harry's life through the naming of his daughter at Lily. On a surface level, the flipping of matrilineal and patrilineal systems, the elevation of feminine power, and the use of feminine archetypes only means that Rowling's novels lend themselves to gendered readings. However, gender and archetypal theory can be forced on nearly any novel. The real takeaway is not that these features exist in the novel, but that they enable deeper readings of the series. Rather than simply accepting characters as masculine and feminine based on their sex, rather than superimposing our culturally learned stereotypes upon Rowling's world, and rather than clumping all magical power into a nice, neat category, Rowling's works require active readers who will seek to resolve these gender conflicts, ask questions, and reread the novel with a variety of lenses. Lily Potter, Molly Weasley, Miro Gaunt, Narcissa Malfoy, Luna Lovegood, and Augusta Longbottom are all, in their own way, transcendent and powerful female characters whose impacts on the novel extend far beyond the surface details and plot points. Thus, it is the women of Harry Potter who empower the boy who lived to face his final challenge. And if we read it this way, we may be able to finally see the tablecloth for what it is. between reading materials for young boys and young girls. 
Distributed with John Newberry's A Little Pretty Pocketbook was a rubber ball intended for males and a pin cushion for females. These physical gendered examples soon began to manifest themselves in the text of children's literature. Literature for girls developed into family stories, a genre typified by female coming of age tales and books that typically took place in the home, including novels such as Little Woman by Louisa May Alcott, A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett, and Anne of Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery. Conversely, boys' books evolved into the adventure story, a genre which is still prevalent in current fiction. The adventure story typically features a young male protagonist with only secondary or tertiary female characters undertaking various exploits. A modern example of the adventure motif is the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling. However, despite fulfilling the prerequisites of a boy's adventure novel, Rowling has also crafted a series which dissolves the rigid gender lines of earlier children's literature by incorporating aspects of both adventure and familial fiction including the introduction of a reoccurring theme of survival and adversity to a variety of obstacles, while also setting large portions of action in domestic settings and placing importance on the characters' homes. Before examining the ways in which Rowling's saga deconstructs the genderization of children's literature, it is essential to review the ways in which the Harry Potter series can be defined as a boy's book and what constitutes a boy's novel. Classification of books for boys spans several genres, including adventure, war, and sports stories, Robinson A's, and information books. While Rowling includes elements of war stories and sports in her novels, the two genres which are most prevalent in Rowling's works is the adventure story and the Robinson A. Adventure stories are, in a sense, what the name implies, but more specific than simply the story of a boy undertaking an adventure, they are defined by Amaro Sullivan as a scenario of young protagonists overcoming natural and man-made disasters with a theme of trials, survival, and having to develop personal strength to overcome all manners of difficulties. Though in this definition, O'Sullivan does not isolate the genre as led by males, she also offers the following descriptions of adventure stories. Numerous adventure tales were loosely based on heroic quest narrative struggle in which a young English male is molded and strengthened by his escapades in the wild and his adventures. Similarly, a Robinson egg was traditionally the story of a protagonist who is abruptly stranded and is thereby cut off from the rest of the world. When the genre began, the isolation was typically the result of a shipwreck, and the story was subsequently set on a desert island where the protagonist must improvise ways to survive before eventually being returned to civilization. However, as the genre evolved, it began to include not just survival on islands, but also in the wilderness. O'Sullivan elaborates that the archetypal motif of the desert island and the wild serves as a metaphor of solitude, and the protagonist frequently has to deal with loneliness, fear, and depression. From this basic realistic struggle, Robinson Aids have evolved to occasionally include science fiction and fantasy elements as well. Harry's time at Hogwarts School, which witchcraft and wizardry, fulfills the Sullivan's aforementioned definitions of adventure stories. Harry experiences trials and is molded and strengthened by his escapades in each of the seven novels. His transformation is evidenced by juxtaposed excerpts from the first and final novels. When the books begin, Harry Potter is an 11 year old boy living with his very normal and suburban aunt and uncle, Vernon and Tina Dursley who are determined to oppose all things out of the ordinary. However, this normalcy is upset upon Harry's extrapolation from the mundane world of suburbia with the introduction of the knowledge of his wizard heritage. Rowling shows the character of Hagrid, a trusted confidant of Albus Dumbledore, telling Harry of his heritage. Harry, you're a wizard. I'm a what? gasped Harry. This knowledge marks the beginning and propulsion of his adventure story. Additionally, Harry's first excursion alone and away from his non-magical family involves him attempting to locate Platform 9 and 3 quarters at King's Cross Station. However, given Harry's own non-magical and isolated background, he struggles to find it. Harry was now trying not to panic. He had no idea how to find this platform. He was stranded in the middle of the station with a trunk he could hardly lift, a pocket full of wizard money, and a large owl. Harry's initial attempt to emerge into the world in which he is supposed to belong is littered with physical obstacles as well as frequent demonstrations, such as this one, of his lack of knowledge of the wizarding world. By the end of the series, Harry is shown to be a competent wizard. However, his most important traits are not his learned skills, but rather his inherent goodness that ultimately leads to a final trial in which Harry's courage and willingness to sacrifice his life for his friends is tested. This is in keeping with the adventure story's requirement of the protagonist having to develop deep personal strength. Rowling writes in the final novel, this cold-blooded walk to his own destruction would require a different kind of bravery. He felt his fingers trembling slightly and made an effort to control them. After Harry willingly allows himself to be sacrificed for those that he loves, he is shown as existing in type of purgatory with his mentor Albus Dumbledore at King's Cross Station. Here, after Harry has persevered through the most difficult of trials, Dumbledore addresses him with open arms. 
You wonderful boy, you brave, brave man, let us walk. Harry has transformed from a young boy attempting to find a sense of belonging in a strange world to a man. His circle of trials has become complete, becoming now the hero of the adventure story. However, the general adventure story is not the only category of voice fiction that is shown in the Harry Potter series. The books also align with the subcategory of the Robinson Age. This is shown with most clarity in the final installment of the series, Harry Potter and the Death of Hallows. The usurpation of the Ministry of Magic, the official government of the Wizarding World, by Voldemort and his followers forces Harry into an extended period of hiding around the English countryside. Although Harry is accompanied by his closest friends, Hermione Granger and Ron Weasley, the three of them are essentially isolated from the comforts of civilization, which is demonstrated by Harry stating that he had lost track of the date, they had not seen the newspaper for weeks. Additionally, the trio is shown as improvising the means of survival from the limited resources at hand, another aspect of a Robin's name. Rowling writes they had nothing to eat except some wild mushrooms that Hermione had collected from amongst the nearest trees and stewed in a billy can. Additionally, the protagonists deal with loneliness, fear, and depression because of their increased frustration at not being able to complete their required task. All three of these attributes are demonstrated during the trio's excursion as they begin to fight amongst themselves, particularly Harry and Ron. An invisible shield expanded between Hermione and Harry on one side and Ron on the other. Harry felt a corrosive hatred toward Ron. Something had broken between them. Harry Potter and the Death of Hallows serves as a precise example of Robinson A. fiction by forcing the central protagonist into a survival situation apart from civilization, the characteristic of voice fiction that has been expanded into Rowling's saga, thus creating a situation which has historically been attributed to males as well as mirroring the real-life situations of survival that the characters of Robinson Maids had to contend with. While fiction for boys became defined by adventure, blood, and survival in the wild, girls' fiction evolved in a different manner. Fiction for girls emerged before boys' fiction with the 1749 publication of The Governess by Sarah Fielding. While The Governess did not set the norm for girls' fiction, it set a precedence for school stories and children's literature. From its origins with Sarah Fielding's novel, girls' fiction evolved into two separate genres, the horse and pony tale and family stories, the latter of which became the most common. However, in spite of the fact that family tales are the most popular form of fiction for girls, there is not one concrete definition for familial fiction. O'Sullivan writes that family fiction is typically written in a realistic mode and sometimes features a female coming-of-age plot. In Brian Atbury's article, Elizabeth Enright and the Family Story Genre, he off offers several definitions for the family story. He writes that Enright's example points toward a definition of the family story as an essentially comic work with a collective hero focusing on a family's continual adaptation to internal changes and external circumstances. He later quotes Lois Cousinet's formulate pattern for family stories which define the genre as concerning happy families, even when one or more parent is temporarily missing or incompetent, with siblings that share pastimes and interests spontaneously without an intervention of an adult and that each child of a given family will display different enough traits that taken together they will present a wide spectrum of possibilities for the individual child. What one lacks, another has, and all will have something complementary to contribute to the family. Such children are always stimulated and never defeated by adversity and quickly respond to challenges and demands both inside and outside the family circle. Their hard work will be rewarded not only in patently appropriate ways but beyond original expectations. Although the formula is a lengthy one, Atbury finds it to be thorough, arguing that it fits most books for girls, including Little Women. While the Harry Potter series fits precisely into the characteristics of boys' adventure stories, the novels also contain, contain several elements of family fiction which bear reviewing. To begin with, while the predominant setting of the series is at Hogwarts, the beginning of each novel is set in the Dursley's home, a house wrought with a desire for a stereotypical suburban family setting. His return there disrupts the predominant adventure story that spans the entire series. His journey is not fluid, and he must revisit each year to his family setting, his primary connection to his birth family, and a place which reflects his mother's sacrifice for his life. Rowling explains this unique familiar reliance on the fifth installment of the series as Dumbledore speaks to Harry. Though well, you can still call home the place where your mother's blood dwells, there you cannot be touched or harmed by Voldemort. He shed her blood, but it lives on in you and her sister. Her blood became your refuge. When you return there only once a year, but as long as you can still call it home, there he cannot hurt you. The predominance of maternal characters and family settings fits the Harry Potter series in categories that are generally specific to girls rather than the aforementioned boys' adventure stories. Additionally, when Harry is not living with his aunt and uncle, he often stays with Ron's parents, Arthur and Molly Weasley. The Weasley's home is the epitomization of dom domesticity because of Molly Weasley's initial characterization as the bearer and caregiver of seven children. Galadero and Smith write that Molly is a formidable woman feared by all the males in her family. She strives to keep them on the good path, reinforcing the image of woman as a civilizer within. 
Mrs. Weasley's firm control of her family and her situation as a maternal figure for Harry is demonstrated in the Chamber of Secrets, the second novel in the series, as she is chastising her sons for stealing their father's bewitched car. He could have died, he could have been seen, he could have lost your father's job. It seemed to go on for hours. Mrs. Weasley had shouted herself hoarse before she turned on Harry, who backed away. I'm very pleased to see you, Harry dear, she said, come in and have some breakfast. Mrs. Weasley portrays two facets of the stereotypical domestic mother, stern as well as nurturing. However, these two homes are not the only places that Harry experiences a familial setting. Hogwarts itself is a type of family, and Harry is often said to feel that he regards Hogwarts as more of a home than his own domestic setting at the Dursleys. Additionally, the layout of Hogwarts is reminiscent of the formula for family fiction that Atbury uses. The idea that each child of a given family will display different enough traits that taken together they will present a wide spectrum of possibilities for the individual child what one has another lacks. This is shown through the use of the sorting hat, a magical hat that divides the students among four different houses depending on their unique skill sets. An action which is summarized by the sorting hat song in Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Now each of these four founders formed their own house for each, did value different virtues and the ones they had to teach. Now slip me snug about your ears, I've never yet been wrong. I'll have a look inside your mind and tell where you belong. This allows for a wide variety of students within the school, similar to the wide spectrum of possibilities as defined by family fiction. Harry's attendance there affirms an atmosphere that adapts to internal changes and external circumstances. An additional characteristic of family fiction is stated by Enright. Hogwarts is shown to be tested internally by continuous staff changes in the defense against dark arts teaching position and by the influx of ministry interference in the Order of Phoenix through Dolores Umbridge's appointment as the High Inquisitor. Additionally, in the seventh novel, the students are forced to band together in order to resist the increasingly tyrannical administration that has taken over Hogwarts under Voldemort's direction. The changes in the attitude of the Hogwarts family during these um, changes and its following of the formulaic pattern for family stories solidify the Harry Potter series categorization into familiar fiction for girls in addition to the aforementioned placement into boys adventure novels. The series dual categorization as both boys and girls fiction has created seven novels which will appeal for what is stereotypically seen as desirable for both males and females, a feat which has allowed the series to expand its literary impact. The fact that Rowling's writing does not maintain placement in only one gender category serves as a point that a wide variety of situations in daily life hold relevance for both males and females. While there is an historical precedent for children to be attracted to novels written for the opposite gender, girls especially have always read boys' stories and many boys read their sisters' books, the blending of gender specific genres in a solitary work sets a precedence and makes a statement about the perception and roles of gender in modern society. Modern gender roles allow for greater equality between the sexes, including corresponding levels of education and more workplace opportunities for women. The real world shift of gender from two separate spheres into a form of androgyny should therefore be reflected in literature, specifically children's literature. This is especially true given research concerning children's understanding of gender. McCabe writes that along with parents, teachers, and peers, books contribute to how children understand what is expected of women and men and shape how they think of their place in the social structure. However, the same research has found that boys are represented, represented in literature more than girls. In order to provide children with a balanced view of gender that more accurately reflects modern society, it is therefore necessary for children's literature to follow in the steps of the Harry Potter series. McCabe's research also reflects that in order for children to obtain uniform ideas of gender, they must be exposed to egalitarian books over a sustained period of time, which will shape their gender attitudes and beliefs. The key to this is sustained as one book is likely to drastically change the child's gender schema. J.K. Rowling's series of novels have set a powerful example in terms of their skillful blending of gender stereotyped fiction and their marked success. The series has given birth to seven best-selling novels, eight movies, a plethora of fan-created websites and discussion boards, and a virtual retelling of the series, all which demonstrates the attraction of a type of genre that blends the stereotypical adventure and domestic stories. This amalgamation is crucial and the defining a new type of children's fiction that maintains a universality that is relevant for both genders and their future generations. Like if you had longer 
to write about? Do you think that she was, a, even though she's the same age here, do you think that she was an example of femininity or leadership? Or One of the articles we came across um, kind of went in depth about how uh, it could be argued that Hermione takes on a motherly role for Harry and Ron, especially born in the seventh book when they're out in the wild. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that article. <laughs> um, we were originally going to include Hermione in this when talking about how um, there's a lot of strong female characters um, in the series and how they do, th and that breaks down stereotypes in the boys' fiction, but then we realized we're more speaking to um, traditional um, boys' and girls' fiction, and so we just kind of cut that part out. But I mean, Hermione's definitely a great example of a strong character in that. The one thing I've seen about her is that she's, um, instead of being like a dumb girl, she's like smarter than do them put together as far as like intellect and yeah. Oh, I definitely think you can make the argument that Harry and Ron have gotten nowhere without her. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I mean that that it's against like she might even be smarter than Mrs. Weasley, like as far as her as far as like academic stuff, mm -hmm. and that she goes against the norm of um, you know Sarah Field. You said the governess, like well, it almost she is a governess. She's even better than the governess, right? Because she's um, a woman who grows from frizzy hair to like leader. <laughs> But I think I could see her more as, um, because of the academic thing, that she has like this huge brain and that women traditionally, even in the children's literature, would not have had, you know, they would have been playing with dolls and she liked dolls, but she surpassed it. Yeah. I mean, I think her placement there definitely, like to what we said at the end, how gender roles are shifting. Like, yeah, she, if we had more, um, wanted to add more, like that would be a great place to include her because she does break those barriers. I had a question for the first speaker. First, I want to apologize for coming in late. Um, I was wondering if you, I mean, I know it's out there, but I'm not familiar with it. What kind of fan resistance was there to that epilogue in book seven? All I could pretty much got on my friends list was inarticulate howls of anger. And there's significant resistance in, in fan fiction. There's even a description, EWE, which means epilogue, what epilogue? And if you decide, designate a story as EWE, you just keep on. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Oh, Penny? Oh, yeah. Um, first of all, I should say that I like completely disagree with your thesis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But. I think I think that the examples that you give, specifically Molly, Narcissa, and Lily, so far from indicating a dominance of matrilineal focus, in fact, reinforce what I see as the significant patriarchal insistence. They're only defined as mothers. We have any number of strong men who are not defined as strong men because their father is Dumbledore, Snape, Voldemort. But the only examples of really strong adult women you gave are defined as such only through the power of mother love. Even when Molly rouses herself to what I would say is sort of the opposite of passivity, that's another thing I would argue is that the opposite of nonviolence is not passive. Sure. But she does so because her child is threatened. Mm -hmm. So the only avenue towards strength for women seems to be through motherhood. Um, that's a good point. Um, I've read a few articles and we've had some discussions in our class about uh, characters like Hermione and Ginny and Bellatrix Lestrange who are problematic you know, for that argument because they do assert their power in um, non-maternal ways and they have arguably, a, a, you know, they. Um, attempt to enter that realm of masculine power that Voldemort and Dumbledore and, and many other uh, male characters um, dominate. However, um, I guess the angle that I was coming at it from was um, that you know you have you have the conflict of uh, aggressive, violent power which some women are able to enter into, uh, but these women are able to maintain their maternal stance and still exert great force over the direction of the novel. And while I agree that passivity is not the, the opposite of nonviolence, um, I wanted to give it that connotation for the purpose of this paper so that I can cut out some words and things like that and just redefine it. For but is there any way for women to be strong outside of one of them? Oh yeah, well I mean I think Hermione is very strong and, and Ginny is you know, certainly a very strong character and Belichick the Strange I think is probably number three in the AP poll of you know, the strongest characters 
Um, McGonagall, too. Yeah, McGonagall. Um, plenty, plenty of uh, strong characters. Um, I suppose, yeah. Right, I, I would argue that all of those are undermined, McGonagall, Hermione, all of them are undermined in significant ways, but, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I have a question. Um, yeah. They, uh, Dumbledore often says that the greatest power is love. Mm -hmm. How would, going off of the maternal um, power, and if that is their only power, how would you compare that to the greatest power of love, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't think that um, I would assert that their only power is maternal, but I do think that it bears a huge role, especially in the inheritance of power and, and how that transfers among characters. As far as um, how love uh, plays into it, mothers are the primary, um, the primary givers of love and that affection. Um, aside from perhaps Dumbledore and, and Sirius, um, I, I don't see uh, male characters as possessing that in, uh, in an incredibly apparent way. So um, I think that just kind of goes to support the idea of, uh, of motherly power.